A military is an armed and organized force intended for warfare, typically used by states. Conventional wisdom suggests that a state would prefer to staff its military with its own citizens rather than foreign legionaries. After all, starting in the 18th century, states began to standardize and professionalize their armies and increase their capacity to mobilize their populations while facing out mercenaries. Most modern states are capable of conducting mass mobilization. With all this in mind, one would think that with the modernization of militaries, foreigners were recruited less, as states would prefer to to staff their own loyal citizens or imperial subjects to foreign fighters and mercenaries. However, a wealth of evidence spanning the last two centuries suggests that this is not the case. Foreign legionaries have played essential parts in many conflicts, serving under states of all regime types, population sizes, and colonial experiences. Between 1850 and 2020, 91 states implemented more than 200 policies to enlist foreign soldiers, who will be referred to as legionaries for the sake of this video. As of 2021, 31 governments maintain legionnaire recruitment policies. Legionnaires differ from mercenaries, contractors, and allied armies. All three categories fight outside of a state's military and command structure, while legionnaires are directly incorporated into the military's hierarchy. Colonial and imperial subjects may also be used as examples of foreign fighters, but will not be considered as foreign legionnaires in this video, as they have ties to the state prior to serving in the army. However, it is important to note that colonial subjects serving in the military may share many characteristics with foreign fighters, like a lack of common language or culture to the state. The source article of this video presents a supply and demand argument for why states recruit foreigners into their militaries. The supply side deals with constraints a state may face when recruiting its citizenry, while the demand side deals with the acuteness of a perceived threat to a state's territory. While there are many troubles associated with recruiting legionnaires, the confluence of supply and demand factors together with additional benefits is what often pushes states to recruit legionnaires. One major hurdle to recruiting foreigners is the language barrier. Rapid communication and the execution of orders is vital for any military to function. If left unsolved, the language barrier can severely hinder a military's performance. One notable example of this issue occurring was the Austro-Hungarian army during the First World War. The majority of the army's officers were German-speaking Austrians, while only a small faction of the soldiery spoke German. Combined with a lack of interpreters and command incompetence, this led to dysfunctionality and resentment by non-Austrian soldiers, who occasionally mutinied and revolted. Desertions and revolts were most common among Slavic battalions, particularly Czechoslovak battalions, but logistics hurdles were faced by all battalions. One country which has successfully solved the language barrier is France. In the French Foreign Legion, people of over 140 different nationalities are subjected to highly rigorous training, which includes a French language learning curriculum. Unlike other countries which form specialized battalions for particular nationalities, the French Foreign Legion integrates people of different linguistic backgrounds through its brutal French learning methods. Another major concern is the question of of loyalty. Foreign fighters with little connection to the land, especially if they're motivated for financial reasons like mercenaries, often present a liability to the military running them, being less disciplined and more likely to commit abuses against local populations than citizen soldiers. Even foreign soldiers who are incorporated under a state's command and control structure face many of the same problems. Without a genuine connection to the state they fight for, even highly structured militaries face struggles to command troop loyalty and often deal with mass defection, desertion, and mutiny. State and non -state State armies typically utilize pre-existing social connections, ethnic or national loyalty to recruit and use their employees. Two examples come to mind, that being Cyprus and Israel. Both militaries recruit foreign nationals of full or partial Cypriot and Jewish descent respectively. Another practical issue with recruiting foreign legionnaires is the risk of external influence over the state's military and its operations. For example, during the Falklands War, British use of Nepalese Gurkhas led Argentina to call on Nepal to end Gurkha recruitment, with the belief that such a policy violated mercenary laws. Following the 2006 Democratic Revolution and takeover by the Maoists, the government pledged to halt Gurkha recruitment, although that has not happened as of yet. With all these hurdles in mind, and more which I did not cover, why do states frequently recruit foreign fighters? As previously mentioned, it boils down to a confluence of supply and demand arguments, although additional benefits may play a role in the state's decision to recruit. The supply side of the theory for why states recruit foreigners deals with the efforts and ease that a state may have when recruiting its citizenries. While states have mass 
of political abilities to recruit citizenries, those can be constrained by potential political costs and risks to the state. Four factors can incur and amplify the costs of recruiting citizens into the army. Firstly, political threats from within the regime. Secondly, threats external to the regime but internal to the state. Thirdly, blowback resulting from ethnic or religious cleavages. Fourthly, labor trade-offs from putting citizen workers into uniform. When the state has none of these variables, it has little constraints in recruiting its citizen population. Having one of those factors will moderately constrain citizen recruitment, and having two or more of these factors will severely impede a state to recruit from its citizenry and will thus incentivize it to recruit legionnaires. Internal Regime Threats In a government composed of a diverse set of political actors, insiders may fear recruiting from the citizenry, as to not empower rivals. When recruiting citizens of suspect elite allegiance, the leader may fear that such rivals may use the military to vie for power. Therefore, this may incentivize them to recruit from foreign countries as to maintain power networks independent from rival actors in the regime. External Domestic Regime Threats When a regime fears a threat external to itself but internal to the state, it may constrain its ability or desire to recruit from the citizenry. In the event of mass protests or an insurgency, the state is physically constrained from recruiting from certain areas or sections of the population. Even when an internal crisis is not occurring, like the years after a civil war or insurgency ends, the government may not have fully re-established civil or military control in formerly rebel-held areas. Finally, during an internal crisis, much of the population may have grievances against the ruling regime, and thus recruiting them into the military may pose risks of unenthusiastic and poor execution at best, and danger to the regime at worst, like mounting insider attacks or using military training to fight against the regime. Salient Sectarian Cleavages When leaders use ethnic or religious identities to distribute political power, recruitment is highly politicized. In a country ruled by a sectarian minority, and where such cleavages have led to repression, two risks are present from recruiting from the citizenry. The first is that arming and training citizens from marginalized groups may present problems in the future, like potentially giving them means to fight against the regime in a future domestic conflict. At the same time, staffing the military with too many co-ethnic or co-religious citizen supporters, burden will inevitably shift to such groups and may cause political raptures within the regime. Labor trade-offs In the event or anticipation of a conflict, a state must consider how each of its citizens are used. They must consider whether the citizen should be employed on the battlefield or in the factory. A citizen employed in the army is a potential citizen not serving in the factory, exchanging one shortage with another. When critical production requires specialized technical skills, this lowers flexibility even further. In a total war, these trade-offs are particularly present due to the scope of material needs. In addition, recruiting foreigners provides the advantage of the state being able to conduct potentially costly or unpopular operations. For example, the French Foreign Legion was frequently used by France to quell colonial uprisings and in the last few decades they were often deployed in high-risk, high-remotely operational zones like the Congo, Kosovo, Lebanon, and more. States experiencing political instability or sectarian violence often recruit foreigners to quell unrest and maintain order. In Bahrain, a country which often experiences both external regime threats and sectarian cleavages, the military has extensively recruited non-citizens. While the exact numbers are a state secret, human rights organizations estimated that around half of the 19,400 military and paramilitary members are foreigners, hailing from a variety of mostly Sunni Muslim countries like Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. The Sunni rulers have extensively used such fighters to quell unrest from its majority Shia population. All these internal factors influence whether a government recruits citizen soldiers or foreign legionnaires. Each can vary in severity, with more severity correlating with more constraints towards citizen recruitment. However, there are also external factors that being perceived territorial threats, which also play a crucial role in determining the decision to recruit foreign legionnaires, the demand side of the equation. A state can have three degrees of perceived territorial threat, that being low severity, high severity, and existential. In a low severity scenario, a country may not be engaged in conflict and does not anticipate any near-term armed confrontation, or are engaging in conflict but are performing well on the battlefield. When a state perceives high severity territorial threat, it is engaging in a conflict and assesses the battlefield situation with a degree of pessimism and fear that the conflict may turn in the enemy's favor. Under a perceived existential territorial threat, a near-term prospect of a military victory may lead to the end of the polity's existence through annexation, conquest, or invasion. Doubts of the state's continuity are put into question, or risk losing critical economic, military, or defense terrain to the enemy. Whenever the severity of the perceived territorial threat exceeds the state's capability to recruit from the citizen population, it will find ways to fill the potential gap. Suffice to say, the more a state's territory is threatened, the more it is likely to recruit foreign legionnaires. A state may have three additional reasons for recruiting foreign legionnaires. Those are to import expertise, importing 
labor or recruiting exclusively from the ethnic diaspora or former colonies to bolster international bonds. These benefits are not mutually exclusive and states may pursue such policies for multiple reasons. Recruiting from the citizenry is often a lengthy and time-consuming process, especially when specific skills are needed. Therefore, importing labor and expertise via foreign legionnaires is often a great solution towards filling specific demand. Meanwhile, many states with large ethnic diasporas often recruit from such populations to bolster international ties with members of their diaspora. Other states may achieve goals of international cooperation through recruiting from former colonies, like Britain's policy of recruitment from the Commonwealth. During the Second World War, each side faced various constraints and high territorial threats, which led them to recruit foreign fighters. Despite having 1 million active personnel and 4 million in the reserve, France sought to recruit legionnaires, most notably exiled Polish servicemen. However, this effort largely failed due to the rapid Nazi victory and the capitulation of France. By July 1940, Britain ended up recruiting foreigners too, from Czechs to Poles, Spaniards, Norwegians, and peoples from all over Europe. By November 1940, Churchill expanded the policy to people from neutral nations. Most drastically, he even recruited people from the enemy nation, as over 10,000 Germans and Austrians, many of whom were Jewish or political dissidents, served in the British Royal Pioneer Corps. As the Soviet Union found itself being under an existential threat of annihilation, they moved to recruit foreigners as well, despite having a large population able to be mobilized. On August 12, 1941, the Soviet authorities gave amnesty to Polish POWs and deportees, raising three whole divisions. Even before joining the war, the United States was also moved to recruit legionnaires, first with the introduction of the draft in September 1940, which mobilized both citizens and aliens alike. Later, Congress passed the Nationality Act of 1940, which waived the requirement that aliens declare an intent to acquire citizenship as a condition for enlisting and provided recruits with an option to naturalize after three years of honorable service. Further legislation was passed in 1944, which offered immediate citizenships to foreigners serving in the US military, even if they were abroad at the time of enlisting. Axis governments also found themselves with the same variables which led them to recruit foreigners at a large scale. By 1938, Italy had supplied thousands of its workers to work in German industries. With labor shortages severely hindering recruitment from its citizenry, the Italian government initially barred Germany from recruiting Italian workers, yet continued to face labor and recruitment shortages. With Italian soldiers bogged down in the Balkans and more being sent to the newly opened Eastern Front, in July 1941, Italy authorized the creation of a Croatian brigade to supplement its contingents in the East. By November 1941, Italy had authorized the recruitment of Arabs and British Indian POWs to bolster its forces in North Africa. By 1942, more policies were implemented which led to the recruitment of tens of thousands of Serb, Croatian, Slovene, and Balkan Muslim volunteers to supplement its forces in Yugoslavia. As Italian casualties mounted on the Eastern Front, they even recruited Cossacks as light cavalry and scouts. Japan's faced similar constraints throughout the war. Between the invasion of China in 1937 and the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, Japan utilized a combination of labor controls, mobilization of women, and importing foreign workers to ensure it could draw soldiers and laborers from its citizenry and Japan's subject peoples in Korea and in Taiwan. However, by early 1942, following the attack on Pearl Harbor and the invasion of Southeast Asia, Japan ended up recruiting heavily from its occupied territories, recruiting 180,000 people from Indonesia alone. However, if one is to understand why nations recruit foreigners and how supply and demand dynamics come into play, one has to look at the history of recruitment policy in Nazi Germany. From 1935 to 1940, legionnaire recruitment was nearly non-existent. The German military was almost entirely staffed by ethnic German citizens of Germany, or Reichsdeutsche. The invasion of the Rhineland, the annexation of Austria and the Sudetenland caused the recruitable citizen population to skyrocket. From 1934 to 1939, the number of soldiers grew from 315,000 to 2.7 million. There were little constraints within Germany or perceived territorial threats to incentivize legionnaire recruitment, and in fact several factors stood in the way for foreign recruitment. Firstly, Nazi racial doctrine put ethnic Germans on top, bringing an automatic distrust to foreigners serving in the military. Secondly, the desire for autarky, a fully self-sufficient state which would only recruit from the citizenry. And finally, Hitler had a personal opposition to legionnaire recruitment. Being a veteran of the First World War, he witnessed the large-scale recruitment of non-Germans in the Austrian army, and he believed that this led to the fall of the Habsburg monarchy. Therefore, he would not repeat the mistake in his new army. However, real constraints and perceived territorial threats would go on to trump 
ideology. By the spring of 1940, Germany had successfully conducted multiple offensives, quickly gaining territory. However, this brought new manpower challenges to the state. Despite Hitler's efforts to stem unemployment, the labor force was beginning to experience shortages. Between 1939 and May 1940, the German labor market was deprived of 4 million laborers. Simultaneously, as Germany reached full employment, the government had no excess labor supply to recruit from, while changes in labor policy caused work mobility to evaporate as the majority of workers were locked into their jobs, many of which were unskilled or semi-skilled. All of this brought increased trade-offs between recruiting soldiers and laborers. By early 1941, the government reported a shortage of over 1.2 million laborers in the armaments industry alone, with only 200,000 of these vacancies being able to be filled in. As Germany launched Operation Barbarossa, the trade-offs between recruiting soldiers and laborers widened. However, the perceived territorial threat was low. The rapid string of victories all over the continent, the introduction of new allies through the tripartite pact, and low casualties, only 102,000 fatalities out of 6 million Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS troops in the first two years, caused optimism to soar. Despite the low perceived territorial threat, labor constraints and the large number of troops dedicated to occupying the West and fighting in the East led to the first legionnaire recruitments. On April 20th, 1940, Hitler authorized the Waffen-SS to recruit from Denmark and Norway to create a new regiment, followed by recruitment in Belgium and the Netherlands. On June 29th, 1941, Hitler ordered both the Waffen-SS and the Wehrmacht to raise new legions. The former recruited from Denmark, Flemish, Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway and Sweden, while the latter recruited Walloon Belgian, French, Croatian and Spanish volunteers. All of these groups were deemed as acceptable by Nazi racial ideology. People from all over Western Europe were joining Nazi ranks. However, at that phase, legionnaire recruitment was still limited. Large numbers of applicants were rejected, while certain foreign groups were categorically excluded. For instance, on June 21, 1940, the 12th Infantry Division received orders to shoot any POWs who were determined to be ethnic Germans. Despite their ethnicity, the Nazi government held a special hatred for their co-ethnics who fought for enemy armies, seeing them as traitors to the German people. In April 1941, Gottlob Berger, a senior Nazi member responsible for Waffen-SS recruitment, proposed recruiting Ukrainians, only for his proposal to be rejected by his superiors. However, as the years went on, further labor constraints and increased territorial threats caused the recruitment policy to change. By November 1941, Germany's recruitment policies went into a new phase of heightened legionnaire recruitment. Domestic constraints due to labor continued to pose challenges to citizen recruitment, only made worse due to mounting losses in the East, increasing demand for materiel. The recruitment of foreign volunteers and forced labor did not stop the constraints. Simultaneously, the perceived territorial threats rose significantly, as casualties mounted and conquered territories were lost. In the two years since Operation Barbarossa commenced, 1.3 million Nazi soldiers had died. A previously majority German citizen army with a small number of Western European forces opened the gates to several million Soviet citizens. In spite of Nazi racial ideology and Hitler disdain for Russians, in November 1941, the German High Command authorized German units to recruit Russians. Merely recruiting volunteers as Hilfswillige from POWs or occupied territories was not enough. So by mid-1942, Germany authorized the conscription of Russians and to fill around 10% of their units with these conscripts. The effects of these decisions were enormous. By August of that year, one in every seven troops in the 18th Panzer Division were Russian. By June 1943, over 800,000 Russians were serving in the German army. In December 1941, the Wehrmacht began recruiting Armenians, Georgians, and other peoples from the Caucasus into the Ostledion and Eastern regions. By 1942 and 1943, the Waffen-SS had authorized to recruit foreigners from the East, including Latvians. To see how drastic this change of policy was, Hitler had an even lower disdain for Latvians than Russians. But later on, Heinrich Himmler announced that Hitler had announced the creation of Latvian and Lithuanian SS volunteer legions. Similarly, in a break from previous restrictions, in March 1943, the government permitted the recruitment of Ukrainians into the SS division Galicia, attracting 32,000 volunteers, with numbers later reaching 100,000. This phase of foreign recruitment also meant loosened restrictions for recruitment in Western Europe. When things seemed rosier, Hitler rejected thousands of French volunteers, viewing them with distrust. But as the situation stacked against the Nazis, Hitler lifted restrictions for the Waffen-SS to recruit French people. What one notices is that in spite of the hateful Nazi ideology and the desires for self-sufficiency, reality made even the hardest of ideologues recruit from people they deemed as inferior. Besides serving on front lines, these collaborationists and legionnaires often played an instrumental role in the Holocaust and anti-partisan activities. I hope to one day explore the role of foreign legionnaires in World War II and why so many chose to fight for the Germans and what roles they played. As winter of 1943 came, Germany was beginning to lose. Casualties were skyrocketing. 
The Soviets were advancing westward, the Allies had invaded Italy, and more invasions were under preparation, and the continued survival of the Reich was put into question. As a result, the German recruitment policy entered its final phase. The perception of an existential threat by German leaders caused them to ignore labor trade-offs and go for an all-out domestic and foreign recruitment. As territorial losses mounted, thousands of collaborators, refugees, and veterans of Axis militaries fled towards Germany. By the spring of 1944, both the Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS were drafting Soviet refugees and Western European collaborators into service. The scale of Legionnaire recruitment was enormous. By April 1944, Soviet Hilfswillige comprised 12% of the entire German army in the field. The Luftwaffe alone had over 300,000 Hilfswillige in the last eight months of the war. The army also began recruiting Legionnaires by cannibalizing former Axis armies. Entire units of Hungarian, Romanian, Bulgarian, and Italian armies were subsumed into the German military. On June 26, 1944, the OKW extended Wehrmacht conscription to all foreign German and stateless people with refugee and or resettlement identification. The SS following suit. Anti-Soviet resistance groups like the Russian Liberation Army, while collaborating with the Wehrmacht previously, were allowed to command several divisions. Perhaps the most drastic change was the recruitment of Polish people into the army, despite being one of the most hated groups in the Nazi ideology. In the final days of the war, legionnaires played a crucial role in Germany's last stand. In the end, what drives the state to recruit foreigners into their military ultimately comes down to supply and demand. How much the state is able to recruit from its own population, and how desperately it needs manpower, are the ultimate determining factors on whether a state is willing to take risks to recruit foreign soldiers, even when it contradicts their own ideological visions or other goals.